Hi everyone and welcome to The Raw Show with Michael McDonnell and I have a very special guest. I have Vanessa Talbot with us today. Vanessa, thank you for joining me on the show. Oh, thank you Michael for asking me. With the signature program, Step Into the Spotlight, Profile Builder and Coach Mentor, Vanessa specialises in igniting coaches to be seen and heard by boosting their profile and increasing their influence, resulting in their magnetic attraction for more leads, more clients and more opportunities. For those that have a mission and a message to help others, Vanessa guides them to better positioning themselves as a public figure so they are able to help a wider audience and create a greater impact with their work. Creator of the popular Facebook group, Coaches, Experts, Change Makers, Step Into the Spotlight. Vanessa is a frequently requested podcast guest and has been featured on media, radio, magazines, newspapers across Australia and the US. A country girl, a wildlife carer, Vanessa likes to hermit on her lifestyle property with four kangaroos, four beautiful horses, bunnies, birds and the nature that surrounds them. So it's very, very wide ranging and... Um, yeah, very creative bio actually. So I thought we'd I thought we'd start with a bit more about you, Vanessa. So would you be able to to share with me and our listeners where you were born and what it was like for you growing up? Okay. So if anyone hasn't already gathered, I am down in Australia. Um and I actually grew up on a wheat and sheep farm in Western Australia. So very much a country background, Michael, have always lived in the country and that's why I still live in a rural environment now. Um, so yeah, so you know, just your typical idyllic farm lifestyle is how I grew up. Nothing unusual, um, but very much used to being isolated and alone as a child, you know, being on a farm, so not living in a town or anything like that. So yeah, we went to school, but once we got home from school, we didn't have access to our friends or anything like that. So I suppose we learnt early, my brother and I, to become quite self-sufficient. And I also found that animals were really good friends as well, hence why I still do a lot of work um, and have a lot of animals around me now. Hmm. So what what was it like in, in terms of education over there then? So was it, was it always... Was it always just a system over there or, I mean, what was it like? Because obviously you, you lived on a, a farm and had animals and things. Was it easy for you to, to go through the likes of, of school and, and education? Yeah, like we did the school bus. So, you know, we had to get on to the school bus in the morning. Uh, school bus probably take an hour to pick up all the other kids on all the other farms, drop them all off as, at the, the primary school and then take us back home in the evenings. Once we hit high school, we had to go away because there was no high school in our area. You know, it's only a small area, so they only had a primary school. So all the farm kids ended up being, um, you know, sent off to the capital city, which was Perth or one of the other big regional towns where they had a high school and boarding. So I did do some of my teenage years as a boarder just so I could go to high school. All oh, right. So was... I mean, this, this is going to sound a little bit of a bit of a strange question, I guess. But um, was it easy for you? Because obviously, you spend spend a lot of time with animals. How, how did that translate into to your ability to to fit in or or make friends in school? Um, you know, I, I I was I was always one of the leaders, so I was always the one who at my school. So I don't think that it made any difference. You know, I've just always naturally I think being a bit of a leader um, and so yeah I, I was the one that was always you know school captain or um, prefect all that sort of stuff so now I think for me personally now you know years and years and years later animals allow me to be really comfortable on my own so I can spend a lot of time out here on my farm, run my business out here on my farm, not see a soul for weeks on end, but still be really, really comfortable with that because um, I have a lot of animal companions. So I think more than anything, it allows you some self-sufficiency. You don't need to rely on um, the companionship of others all the time. Mm. It's just, does that... Does that make it does that make it easier or harder to run the business then? So if if we're if we're out on the farm and things, are there any 
there any complications around running your business in, in a more isolated environment? Yeah, look, there was when I first started out here in country Australia, you know, we are, we're not anywhere near any of the capital cities. We're sort of, you know, way out in the country in Australia. We didn't have really good internet. So when I first started my coaching business, which was about six years ago now, uh, I was trying to do those things like group online programs, webinars, all that sort of stuff. And my internet was so bad that a lot of the time the calls were cutting out. I couldn't get through a webinar straight because it would cut out. And that really, I feel, uh, held things back. And that was just the technology. Mm. you got to remember also that my clientele isn't here either. So for me to run a coaching business, I had to have the idea, um, you know, the staff to make it run online because there's no clients out here where I am, especially not in my niche, which is coaches mm. and change makers. They're not really out here in this small rural environment. Most of them are farmers and orchardists and stuff like that. So that really was something that did hinder. But after a couple of years, my particular area uh, was one of the first to get Australia-wide better internet ke connection. So that really helped and that then enabled me to do the group programs, um, even one-on-ones. You know, I have to do one-on-ones via, back in those days it was Skype, now we use Zoom a lot. But still, without a stable internet ke connection, it was actually really difficult. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine the the technology making much of a difference if, if, if the internet's slow. I mean, there's, there's obviously a certain certain elements of technology that would make a difference clearly yeah but if, if the internet's just not just not quick enough to support what you want to do then I imagine that being quite difficult yeah so that made the first you know a couple of years uh, a bit of a challenge mm. uh, in that aspect but thankfully once we got the new internet brought in here into Australia and we were one of the first places to get it and to be able to test it out um, everything changed and then I was able to do you know, I had more confidence about running a session or a webinar or a group program and not having to worry that it was going to chop and cut out all the time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I can imagine that even gave you some element of, of freedom as well. I mean, being able to, to suddenly be able to do things that you otherwise were, were incapable of doing. So were, were there any struggles that, that you had, <coughs> excuse me, in, in the initial stages. So we, we mentioned technolo technologies being one of them, but do you have any, do you have any th things that you had to overcome in order to, to get to where you are today? Yeah, I had a lot actually. Um, the first thing was extremely um, introverted as well. So, and you know, that's why I adjust quite well to being on my own and having animal companions anyway. Uh, so introversion, uh, didn't help. Uh, I'm hopeless at networking. So yeah, I'm, I'm not good at doing the whole networking scene and all that sort of stuff, which when I first started, that was the main avenue coaches were going down. They were doing networking to try and build their businesses. So that's why I ended up building an online community. Once I got good internet, <laughs> mm -hmm. I was able to build a internet community in terms of a Facebook group. And that's what helped me um, in that aspect. But up until that point, it was a bit of a challenge. And the second thing, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, the, sorry, go on. The second thing, I guess, was at the time I started my coaching business, I was also going through a divorce. So having that emotional load on as well. So all of a sudden, you know, I had been, before I got into coaching, I was running a large company with my then husband at the time in the mining industry. So, you know, stacks of money coming through, um, didn't have to work many hours or anything like that. And when we got divorced, I got uh, basically, you know, taken out of that company and I had to start all over again. And so that's why I chose coaching because it was a way of me being able to stay at home. I had a small daughter as well. So that was the whole coaching avenue. Oh, this is something I can do. I have business experience and um, I can stay home with my animals and, of course, my small daughter. But with a small daughter, with a toddler, you know, the, and she wasn't at school when I was first starting out. So there was a lot of times you couldn't really do much business work. So the first week, first couple of years were 
really slow in building that business and it wasn't until she started going to school that I was able to get some time to do a lot of business building. But what I used to do was was um, in the evenings, you know, if I could get her in bed by 8 o'clock, I would then work on my business and, and my study for my coaching at that time from, say, 8 to 1, 2 o'clock in the morning and that's when I used to fit in my business hours. Right, well, I mean, it... it it comes across then that you you had to you had to almost use what you were given then so particularly with with the daughter as well i mean what what was that like structuring the business around having having a family well that's what you have to do you have to structure it around it uh so you know my days where most people would be working on their businesses my days i also have a country property because i kept the country property so i had that to run the horse farm to run um, fencing to do, you name it. So during the day, I spent much of the day with my daughter and we were out and about uh, running the, the farm. And then the evenings I would work on my business. So I had to structure the whole thing around that. Right. So if someone, because I'd imagine that there are quite a few people listening to this that might actually have a family and, and trying to build a business as well. Do you have any any suggestions or, or advice for them in terms of, you know, just, just making it more doable? Yeah, you've got to set boundaries. Like you've got to decide when your time is on. And I decided it was that 8 till 2 o'clock in the morning type phase when I could, could do my stuff. It takes a higher level of commitment, you know, because you do have to work around, but you've got to find the hours. You might find that, you know, if you've got a small child, maybe they sleep a couple of times for a few hours during the day. So if that's the case, just jump into your business activities then and make the most of it while they're sleeping, for example. So it comes down to um, being quite strict on yourself as well. You kind of can't get to that thing where you go, I don't feel like it today because the fact is you won't get anywhere. You kind of got to jump in when you have the opportunity to make the most of it uh, because, you know, you do want to spend time with your growing family as well. I didn't want to miss out on my child. No, no, of course not. I mean, it's mm. obviously it's, it's the time that you probably wouldn't get back, right? It's not something that you want to miss. No, you don't so want I, to miss it. Yeah. So how how did your, your introversion play out when, when the internet started? So so when you were able to do certain things, I mean, did did the, the fact that you were a bit more introverted actually play a part in that? Or do you think you were able to to overcome certain things? I've overcome a fair bit. Uh, so, you know, I was painfully shy um, just because, you know, I... I don't hang out with a lot of humans, you know, being a more on an isolated property. So as I said, networking didn't work for me. I would be the person crawling around and hugging the walls of the room at any networking meeting and, and not being able to talk to anyone new. So that wasn't going to work. But how did it work for me? You know, online worked well because I could create an online community, be able to jump in um, and not have to actually be with all those energies personally. And online, you can switch off, get out of there very quickly when you want to as well. Uh, for so someone like me who's an introvert and an empath, the online community, you know, you don't have direct access to all the energies so much. So that's easier as well. And But I definitely, definitely had to reach inside of me and find that other side you know, so you've got the introversion side, but then you've also got to discover that side of you that actually enjoys to some degree the stepping into the spotlight. And you have to give that stepping into the spotlight your bigger why. So we're not just doing it because we, we're not natural extroverts. So we can't just do it for the sake of, you know, we're an extrovert and we love the limelight because we actually don't. So you've got to assign your bigger why to that stepping out and creating your profile, so to speak. And I had to assign the bigger why, which was I need to build this coaching business because I don't want to go and work a nine to five job. I've always, you know, done my own businesses, done really well with them. And I want to stay home with my daughter and I just want to work from home. So that was the bigger why. So that then enables me to, not change my personality as such, but force myself into some visibility. 
Mm. Well, what, what would you say the difference is between changing your personality and, and forcing yourself to, to be more visible? Because for, for me, the, the, there seems to be a line, but what, what would you say that line was between the two? Well, you're either an extrovert or you're not. So you can't actually fake, you know, you can, well, you could fake being an extrovert, but you won't last at it. Do you know what I mean? It will be too taxing and too draining. So you've just got to find that piece of you that's actually discovers that you're actually really, really good at delivering your message or whatever it is that you're really good at. So for me, I'm really, really good at delivering my message and I'm really, really good at connecting people. And so once you step into that and doing that, it feels natural enough. It doesn't mean you'll be able to keep it up continuously. You do need to draw back into your introversion shells at times. Um, but it's something that you can sustain. And it's also natural to you as well when you discover your natural talents. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that, that I've actually experienced as well because I, I've, been, I've been an introvert for the majority of my life. And um, mm. I, I often... I often describe myself as a an ambivert in training, right? So it's, it's it's having this ability to okay, in this situation, I have to be X, Y, and Z. But then, as you say, it is quite draining. So when I'm in groups more than I don't know, say four, you know, any, any, anything more than four or five, whereby you know it's easy to it's easy to get into the conversation. Like I find it hard to just interject my thoughts into conversations. So if, if I'm in if I'm in large groups, I find it quite difficult, and I tend to to not actually engage at all. I mean, I'm there, I'm stood there in the group, but I'm kind of keeping quiet and let other people have their say. So when I'm in in groups big, big, bigger than that, I've got to think, okay. I've got to understand when to talk and when not to talk. I've got to be a bit more aware of when it's my turn to have my say, so to speak, because obviously there's, there's this element of I don't want to go too far and then not mm. give other people a chance to, to have their say. So I, I have had moments when I've had to sort of say, hang on, other people haven't had a chance to talk yet because obviously I can, I can get my points across and I can explain things and I can go a little bit deep into things but that takes an amount of time, right? And then other people are just stood listening to me. And then as someone that's, that is an introvert, you could sort of step back and go, I, I actually took hold of the conversation maybe more than I would normally. And it, it's, it is difficult. It is hard to, to find that balance. So do you have any, any suggestions, I guess? Well, obviously, for me yeah. as well. Um, do you have any suggestions for people that, that want, to, want to put themselves out there, but perhaps... It, kind of goes against their initial personality traits yeah okay well this is really interesting because a lot of people when they meet me in the flesh so you know if I do end up going to Sydney you know and hanging out with a lot of people that in my industry they'll often be surprised that I'm the one that's you know not talking being quiet staying at the back of the room because they have this idea that because you do step in the spotlight that you're that, you know, I'm constantly going to be the one who wants to, to be in the limelight when actually I'm different. So first off, that can be quite a shock for people. But what I've found is that put me in a room of people where I don't have to lead and I'll be quite happy to fade into the background and just be quiet and listen. But give me the stage or give me the leadership position and I'll step into that, into that role where I really love that leadership and I think that's a bit of the, the balance for me. Do you know what I mean? So if you give me the stage or you give me that leadership role or you give me a group program to run, I'm going to allow my leadership to come through. And that's what people will often think of as an extrovert. It's just because you're um, a natural leader. So it, I think for people it's about finding, yeah, there's a balance there because it's unsustainable as you probably have already experienced, Michael, trying to yeah. to be in that other position all the time. Yeah, um, definitely. But it is about very much knowing when to step up and shine. And that usually is when you're stepping into your special gifts. So, you know, what do you love to do? Where do you, you know, what floats your boat, so to speak? Where do you rock? And just stepping into that and owning it and knowing that you're really good at it and you can do it. And then when you're off that stage, it's like a lot of actors and stage performers. Like, let's look at Beyonce, for example. A lot of people don't know that she's actually a huge introvert off stage. And yet when she hits that stage, 
she takes on this Sasha Fierce role, as she calls it. Mm. And that's a little bit what I do as well in the sense that when you hit that um, place where you are delivering your message, you're leading your people or whatever it is you're doing, you know, standing on the stage speaking or leading a workshop, whatever, you take on that role that you're shining in your best light. But then when you walk out of that, the minute I walk out of it, boom, I'm back to the shy, introverted girl who would rather stand in the corner. And I'm actually totally fine and okay with that. I don't see a problem with that at all. I actually really like being able to exist in that contrast. Right, well, that, that sort of brings up brings up two questions for, for me. So the, well, we'll start with the first one probably because I don't, I don't want to give you two questions. And the, the first one is how, how would you suggest dealing with situations whereby you don't get the, I'm trying to think of the right word, you don't get the right permission to do the extrovert thing so to step into the leader and do that sort of thing i mean for for beyonce is the example that you gave it's her performance so mm. she so she's given the permission to do that if you're on mm -hmm. stage then it's your show so you mm. you, say, you sort of g yourself up get yourself into that that state of okay here we go this is me being me and it's just gonna be my version of, of extrovert or ambivert or whatever the, the term you want to use but then if you're as you say in terms of like networking there's there's that shift in when is it my turn and to, to do that sort of thing and when do I you know step away and let other people do it how, how, how do you balance the I don't. How do you balance the permission? You don't. <laughs> I don't. Like if I'm at a networking meeting, I'm just my quiet self. I don't even try and take over or it's just if they want to talk to me, they'll talk to me and I'm, you know, pretty good with one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm not going to try and work the room, so to speak. So it's mm -hmm. just not my style. It's just about knowing your style. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't in a network meeting try unless I'm leading the network meeting or I've been brought in to be the guest speaker, but it's, I mean, even that, like, for example, I've been to network meetings where I've been take, brought in as the guest speaker and I've been wandering around the room and, you know, stay, being quiet and staying out of everyone's way and avoiding people as you do. And a lot of people kind of just bypass me because I kind of look small and submissive or something like that. And then I think a lot of them get quite shocked when they actually see that this quiet girl who didn't want to talk to them is the one that's there to be their guest speaker and take the stage yeah definitely uh, so how go, go yeah, on. So I, I don't I, I don't feel the need when I'm doing the networking to actually try and step into that into another role because I'm just not not on that stage or I'm not in that leadership role so I'm, I'm not going to step into it do you know what I mean that's just me I mean for someone else you know <laughs> I would feel, Michael, I would feel that I was trying to force myself to be someone I'm not if I was trying to step into that extrovert role at a networking thing if I wasn't there as the guest speaker when she took the stage, so to speak. Right, that, 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 that tends to lead itself over to the, the second question, which was from, from the outside looking in, it can seem very, very inauthentic for want of a better expression so you, you you're obviously the, the introvert a bit like myself in terms of the fact that you like your own space sometimes and you need to to recharge mm. from from social engagements and things but then how, how how do you deal with from the outside looking in having essentially two different personalities I don't think it's two different personalities. I always say that we have everything we need inside us and when we want to bring it out, we're able to just access and bring it out. So obviously for me, I have this thing that I feel that I come at a network meeting, but like I said to you, know, I don't do well at networking meetings. I don't converse or get, you know, do one-on-one -on -one really well or meet new people really, really well. Um, so I don't pull that out of me. So I don't think it's inauthentic at all. I think it's actually that we all have the different sides to us and we choose when we can step into that role or when we actually, more importantly, want to step into that role. So for me to go and take the stage, if I'm at a networking meeting, it's actually probably serves me best to actually gather my energy 
and spend that time, you know, hugging the walls, so to speak, on the outsides and not mixing with too much people so that I have all my energy for when I get up on that stage. And that's actually not unusual. As I said, there's a lot of actors and performers that you won't get a word out of them, um, you know, off stage or whatever, but they can access that other side of them when they need to to get up there and be that person that they need to project. Right. So I, I quite like the analogy that, that you use there of having the, the different sides. So how, how would people be able to, to cope with that? Because obviously I, I mentioned not being authentic, but then you said that it's not being authentic. So how, how would you suggest people have, have that conversation with themselves? Because obviously there's, there's, there's a lot of talk of, of being yourself now and, and being authentic and showing up what's and all, so to speak. And yeah. how, how, how would you suggest people have that conversation? Because obviously there's, there's this element of, of awareness where you sang on, this is very different when I am in this situation to what I'm like when I'm with such and such a people. And, I mean, it's, it's a conversation that I know I've had with myself. So how, how would you suggest others do that? Yeah. Look, to be honest, I reckon if you're worried about what other people are thinking, you're, you're, you're worrying too much. Do you know what I mean? Like I mm -hmm. would never ever, I would never even worry or be concerned about what they're thinking. I just know that they're going, when I hit the stage, oh, is that that, is that, that girl that was there? I've had people come up to me afterwards and go, I never thought it was you hitting, that was going to get up on the stage, but you were amazing on the stage. Mm. I don't care that they don't um, think, you know, I'm not worried what they're thinking beforehand. And I think that's the key is just, just to know who you are and how you like to operate and how you like to be and not worry about, what other people may be expecting of you. So, you know, if I go to something and I'm in the crowd, they may be expecting the best, the, the guest speaker to come in and enter the room like she just stepped out of her, you know, just entering the room like a queen or something. Instead, I, I enter quietly. I usually come in through a back room. I do all that sort of stuff. So it's about not worrying or not trying to live up to what you feel other people's expectations may have may be of you and if you can truly just be yourself and how you know you need to conserve your energy and how you know you like to operate then you're in the best place yeah definitely it's something that that i that, that, that i had to, to realize it was a few years ago when i when i had to, to go through this process myself but then i realized okay well it depends on the situation that you're in. I mean, are you able to to deal with or, or cope with or, you know, just be able to, to step into the situations in a particular way? Because obviously some, some situations require you to be at a certain level, a certain amount of energy that, that, that you have. So if you're, if you're on stage, that requires a different level of, of energy. If you're networking, that requires a different, you know, because it, it depends on on how much you you need to give to that situation right like if you're alone and you're you're spending time with with your animals or you're reading or whatever that's that's almost like a, a low uh, it's almost like um a, yeah it, it is very very much a low energy activity it's something you don't need you don't need, you don't need to g yourself up for you don't need to, to motivate yourself and inspire yourself to get on there and and deliver in the best way possible because you're you're reading and you're spending time by yourself but then you're able to understand that it's just me at a different level at a different mm. you know it, 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 yeah it, it could just be energy it could be commitment it could be you trying to to cope with the situation that you're in and I, I do find that there are people out there that do struggle with it and there are people out there that that don't I think it does come down to this questioning of if is it actually who I am when I do that kind of thing or or isn't it so yeah it's good it's good that you paint that picture of of having different sides to yourself but it's still it's still you you know you're you, you you're yeah. the coin so to speak you're the cube you know you're the cube yeah. with the many sides but you're still you're still the cube right yeah if i can add this you know from what you sort of you know what you just mentioned you know is it really me this other part of me i think if you have to question it then yeah you've got something to question but if you don't have to question it you just go well you know, that's me, I can do that when I'm there, but this is me when I'm here, you know, and I need a lot of time to regroup. If you just accept the way you are, I don't think you've got anything to worry about. But the minute you have to start questioning it, then maybe 
you are might be trying too hard or being inauthentic. Do you know what I mean? That's kind of what I think. If you've got to question it, um, when really the whole way of your being should be so natural to you. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's almost like the harder it is, yeah, that the, then it kind of means that okay, that that means you've got something to question if it's too difficult yes. for you to actually be yourself. I'd imagine. Yeah, and, and and that's where I'm kind of leading. You know, if you've got to start questioning it, and it's hard, also, um, there's no doubt about it. You know, as an introvert you won't naturally go and step out into the spotlight and shine. But if you can access that self of you, that, that part of you, you know, I've had, I've worked with a lot of people who want to do public speaking and they're introverts, but once they find they can actually, um, you know, stand up on a stage and they actually really get to like it after a few times. So, you know, it is, it is, if it is natural to us, we will feel fine with it, even though the first few times we're obviously going to be nervous or feel a bit out of our comfort zone. But if it's a continuous thing, um, then, yeah, I think you probably, if you're questioning too much, then it's, it's not natural at all. Mm. Do, you have, do you have a certain way of knowing how much time is enough time? So, so for me, it was like maybe two or three attempts at the thing so ha having to put myself into that situation where I needed to to step up to the plate so to speak a after the few times it became comfortable and it felt felt quite good but then I is there a limit where, where you sort of start to question it is there a certain number of of times that you're exposed to it before you decide it's just not for me um well, I can tell you right now, I still don't like networking. So, I made, you know, I made that decision. That's not for me. But take me to a networking where I get to lead the stage and it's a completely different matter. Um, but just tell me to go along to a network meeting and I'm not going to do it. So <laughs> how many times? I don't know. I think you just, you know, I, I, that's a really hard one to answer because I think it would be really different for everyone, I reckon, Michael. But mm. I just think if you know who you are and, you know, what, what you enjoy doing and where you shine and, um, and do that and obviously allow your growth as well because, you know, we all want to grow. So something that might seem strange to us, it doesn't mean that it's always going to stay strange. That's, I think, another thing to be mindful of too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, yeah, it do, does seem like it is different for everybody. And I guess everybody, I mean, you mentioned like boundaries and limits and things before. I mean, if, if you hit your limit and it becomes too difficult, then that's kind of when you make the decision. Yeah, like I just know, as I said, I use the networking thing. I ain't ever going to be able to go along to a speed networking meeting or go into a huge network meet and work the room. It's just not going to happen. So I know my boundaries there. You know, I know who I am and what I can do there in that sense. I'm just using that as an example. I know everyone listening will have their own ideas where they know, oh, I know where my boundaries are around that. I know where I can push myself and where I think, no, that's enough. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's yeah, it does definitely come across like that. That, that that's a form of of awareness that a lot of people would probably benefit from from being able to achieve. But how how did that change when you started using, say, social networks and, and Facebook and things? How how did that change when when technology came into the picture? Yeah, it opened up a whole new world for me. You know, because as I said before. Um, coaches were trying to get clients by mainly networking back in those days and that was pretty damn scary for me back back then and still scary for me now to do in-person stuff so embracing uh, the social media aspects of thing and I particularly use Facebook so Facebook is where I feel really comfortable and shining uh, might tackle LinkedIn in 2018 we'll see how we go there but it definitely helped me step into that leadership role and there's come growth from that, growth from since, you know, I built an online community for starters. Yeah, so how, how did you actually go about doing that? So I imagine you had certain struggles initially, maybe that's, that's more of an 
assumption that they mean knowing your story at all, Vanessa. So it's more yeah. just trying no, to... No, I, I didn't actually. I actually embraced the idea because I thought this is, you know, because I was always looking for something I could just do from home and I didn't have to leave home and I didn't have to mix with people socially. But online said, seemed like, oh, that's good. Do you know what I mean? Because I don't have to be face to face or anything and I can still build a community um, and still enjoy interactions and connections with people. Uh, but don't actually have to do the whole in the room thing. So there wasn't really any hesitation around it. I actually went for it like, you know, it was like, oh, wow, because I had gone onto social media and done this with Facebook and done the old typical uh, business page as well as personal profile. But there was only so far I was progressing with that with a business page. And then I had started to join when I discovered the idea of the Facebook groups. And I started to join some groups. And I actually saw the community that some of the other coaches were building around their Facebook group. And I just knew immediately, this is for me. So there was no hesitation. Um, it actually, I just, I just knew it was going to work well for me and my style and how I prefer to connect. All right, cool. So if, if someone was, was wanting to, to build something around their, around their business to, to help them business wise or even just to just to help with networking i mean f facebook groups is definitely something that's becoming more and more popular i mean this year so so we're in 2017 now almost 2018 and how, how would you suggest people go about it so there's, there's a lot of talk of of growing facebook groups now there's a lot of talk of using them and, and, and i know facebook's trying to pump a little bit more more of their focus into Facebook groups and give them certain certain freedoms and certain you know ways of maybe just improving the standard of the Facebook groups like they're allowing certain things within groups that you wouldn't get anywhere else so how, how would you suggest people go about growing their their, their Facebook groups uh, the first thing is to, you know, when I talk, because I do teach people how to actually build their Facebook groups from the success of mine. Mine actually grew from zero to 500 in the first week. So I knew I was on to a winner because of that, the fast growth in that first week when I first opened it. Uh, and a lot of Facebook groups don't. They struggle for much, much longer. So there were a couple of things that I realised very early on that were the key to it. And the first one was really defining the one purpose of the group. So not trying to have a group that's too broad in scope or anything like that. So, for example, just, um, you know, a business group. There's so many business groups out there and they're all very, very similar. So you've got to decide what is the one purpose for my business group. Is it for business um, owners? Is it for business um people who want to build their expertise as a leader in business. You know, you've got to decide a scope. So it's that one purpose. And the second one I worked out because I analysed a lot of the most successful groups on Facebook, and this is what I teach, other than having a very defined purpose for their group and not being too generic or too random with their purposes, the other thing was there was a formula for the name. And it's tacking into that formula to get the right name that's going to attract the people that want to come in and join your group. So that was the second thing was using that formula. So if you look at my group, it's coaches, experts, change makers, and then step into the spotlight. So we have a two part formula there. It's who the group's for, coaches, experts, change makers, and then it's the benefit they get from it. Step into the spotlight. You know, you, you're going to, be able to shine here you're going to learn how to build your profile um, you're going to learn the way that everyone else is doing and that seemed to be the formula that I found behind the majority of the fast growing and highly engaged Facebook groups they used a formula for their name like that so they're the two things that I always ask people to look at first with their Facebook groups then after you've done that You've then got an establish a vibe and an energy for your group and actually keep that going. So that's probably the toughest bit after you get past the first bits. And that actually takes some commitment to your Facebook group. So a lot of people see their Facebook group as Facebook is that waste of time thing during the day. You know, I don't know if you've heard it, Michael, but I hear a lot of people say, I don't have time to have my own Facebook group. 
Mm. But a Facebook group is a really, really, really good um, two twofold thing. First, if you're getting all your target market in there, and that that attracts with the name and the purpose of the group. So that's why you've got to make sure the formula is there for the name to attract the right people into your group. So first of all, there you've got possible clients, possible, you know, a whole pool of people who could possibly join your programs or, or that you can sell your services to when you're in business. The second thing is if your group becomes known for one distinct thing, like mine is known for stepping in the spotlight for profile building, you have some groups out there known for other things. And it's fast growing and engaged. What it does is put you on the radar of other influencers as well. So the thing is to decide, okay, I do have time for a Facebook group and see your Facebook group as part of your business strategy. You're not scrolling through the Facebook feed, wasting time. <laughs> you know, some people kind of associate it with that time where you're sitting there on Facebook, you know, just scrolling away and, and, and looking through all the feed. That, that can be time wasting, yes. But your business Facebook group should be allocated the same, you know, time each day, exactly the same as you do your other business strategies each day. So that's another thing. It's that commitment and seeing it as a business building tool, not a time waster. All right. It seems it seems like uh, it seems like a very productive way of seeing the Facebook group because you are right. There are people that do spend countless hours on on not just Facebook but social media as well, just yeah. scrolling through, not really not really doing much and then saying that, you know, it's a waste of time. So, well, it probably is a waste of time if you waste time doing it, I guess. Um, exactly. So, so yeah. how, how did you manage to get your first 500? So if someone wanted to go from, okay, I am going to start a group. It's going to be for X to achieve Y. So they use the formula for, for crafting the name. They understand the, the purpose of the group. What, where do people go? So it's almost like having a website. There's no point in having a website if, if no one sees it, if no one, if no one visits it and, and things. It's not like a, a build it and they will come type scenario. You've got no, to then think, okay, how, how, do I, how do I get people in? So how, how did you get your initial 500? Okay, so uh, what I initially did was I created a, a Facebook event. I invited all my friends to that event, which was to the launch of my Facebook group. I invited not all my friends, but all my friends who were in the coaching industry. And I had a lot of friends in the coaching industry because I was also a coach trainer and mentor at one of Australia's biggest coach training facilities. So, you know, I had a lot of the friends that were students um, or other coaches as well. So my audience was already there amongst my Facebook friends, create the invite, invited them all. They all jumped into it, you know, mm -hmm. and it just went whoosh, zero to 500. Now, here's the thing, you know, down this side when you have suggested groups from Facebook, Facebook yep. are only going to show your suggested your group as a suggested group and then that's how you get people coming in, of course, because Facebook are showing it as suggested group down the side and making people aware of your group. Facebook are only going to show that to fast-moving, fast-growing and highly engaged groups. So you've got to be in there from the word go, getting that engagement happening. Facebook loves the engagement within groups and if a group is a dead group facebook aren't going to help you out because they don't want to um put your group in suggested group if there's no action happening in there do you know what i mean mm, they yeah. want to send they want to send their facebook um users to the best group experiences they can find hence why having an event like i did and then what we had for that first week were things like you know Prizes, giveaways, we really had the buzz going so that everyone was in there. We had a lot going on. And then Facebook then helped me out from then on because I built that buzz in that first week, had a lot of engagement and a lot of activity. And then Facebook helped me from then on. Uh, so Facebook helped me pretty much get from zero to 10,000 quite quickly. And then we slowed it all down and we're around the 16,000 mark now. We don't really need to grow it anymore. Um, and so we're keeping it more on a go slow now. Uh, but that's how it happens, Michael. So 
that's why a lot of groups, you know, they might have their first 70 members and then they don't really go anywhere from there. It's because you're not getting any help from Facebook for starters. And you didn't create some sort of buzz or activity that's going to have Facebook register and see the flock of activity that's in there and then they help you out. If they don't see that, they can't help you out. Well, they're not going to help you out. Ah, right. So it, it seems it seems like you, you get the initial buzz and then Facebook starts to help. It's almost like... Um, they'll help you, yes. They'll help. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's almost like you're using, using the, the platform that you're on. So it reminds me of say say um books on amazon like if you get initial sales or whatever you end up on like the the hot picks or, or something like that or like the the editors yeah. you know yeah, recommendations or whatever that's exactly right they want facebook want their users facebook people to have great experiences they want to send them to great groups they don't want to send them to dead groups so yes they're doing all that registering and if you actually look down the side when you're on your Facebook and you come up to the side and you'll see those suggested groups because they know, you know, and, and another way that they, they show those suggested groups too is by showing them to friends of people that are in those groups as well. So that's why I'm saying the quicker you can grow your group, the more likely Facebook are also to show if you've got lots of people in there in that first week, say zero to 500, Facebook are also going to help you by showing your suggested gr your group as a suggested group to the friends of those people that have already joined your group. Um, so they, they do all that registering and, and do that. But if you look at every one of those groups that come up on your side on suggested groups, it's either got your friends in it or some of your friends. It's, and the other thing do, if you go and have a look at the stats, because before, before you join a group, you can go to the about section and Facebook will show you, you have to scroll on down, but they will show you some of the stats about that group. So every time I see a suggested group, I go and check out the stats and most of those groups are high growing and have a lot of post activity in there. Right, so it, it seems like you, you have to get to a certain point before then you can start to utilise the the platform yes. to help you grow yeah so it yeah i mean it's something that, that, that i see as well so if if i'm on facebook and i see and i see suggested groups it it, it does always have either my friends in or there's definite um, engagement in there i guess because your friends high are in activity. there yeah high activity in those groups that are suggested groups and that's what facebook then um send them out so yes you do have to start your group off which is why when i do my facebook training to to people who come along and join that program with me they get to see the techniques that we use to build the buzz and create as many people as possible within that group in the first week um, by buzz building activities, launch parties, all that sort of stuff without actually having to do the other technique that um, other group owners use, but I never did. Um, I just wasn't going to do it. It was too laborious, but a lot of group owners will do this and they will just manually send out um, personal invites by messenger to all their Facebook friends to get them in there. Right, so you sort of go down the uh, the one by one type route. Yeah, just take your friends and do not with Facebook. You've got to be careful not to do the invite friends thing. You know how you can invite people to your page and they can choose to like it or not. Mm -hmm. If you actually do invite friends to your Facebook group, it will automatically put them in there, and that's a big no no, as we all know people you know don't throw someone in your group you have to give them the power of choice but at this moment facebook just you know if you can you can actually invite all your friends to your group but you'll be putting them straight in there so most smart group owners will do a manual invite that is meaning write up a private message and send it to each and one of their every friends via facebook messenger that's very time consuming especially if you have a lot of friends and I've got friends who own big, big groups and that's how they got their start and how they built their group. But they were basically in their group doing that strategy 24-7. And I just, you know, I wasn't going to do that strategy. No, no, I mean, it sounds like with, with, with the family that you've you've got and the animals that you spend your time with as well, I can imagine you were you were quite, um, at, least, at least short for time, so you had to make the most of the time that you had. 
Yeah, absolutely. I um, just don't want to be bogged down on social media all day long. I really enjoy the time that I go in there to mix with my group members. You know, Michael, you're a member. We go in and, you know, I have fun. We laugh. You know, we, we some of us can get very opinionated. There's a, there's debates in there. Um, but also a lot of, uh, you know, we can do fun things with one another as well, uh, especially with those group members that you get to know really well because they're regular contributors. Uh, so, you know, I allocate my hour each day to go in there and it may not be a whole hour in one block. I might be breaking it down into, you know, 10 minute blocks throughout the day, but I'll allocate that hour per day to, to be in my group. Um, cause that's one of the best things you can do if you're, a gr if you are building a Facebook group is to make sure you take the position as a leader in your group and not just play admin. So a lot of group owners are getting stuck in playing just admin and therefore a lot of members don't even know that they're the owner of the group, do you know what I mean, or the creator of the group. So therefore it doesn't end up serving them any purpose. You need to establish yourself in a leadership role right from the very start and not play admin. So you give the admin tasks to someone else. I, I have, you know, a couple of admin in there doing those tasks. I only go in there each day to spread some value. Um, Likes and likes and posts communicate with group members. All right, excellent. So we've we've talked about a lot out, Stephen S. We've gone all the way from from you not enjoying networking and and struggling with just well just the way that you are, I guess. But then when the internet came along, everything suddenly started to take okay. off. So yeah. have you have you had any have you had any things that that you experienced that you learned from so we're sort of going down the road of a, 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 any lessons that you learn from mistakes that you've made that, that yeah. benefit our listeners yeah absolutely like you know i was really shy though i ran a big big mining company with my husband at the time he was the one that did all the work with going out and serving the clients and he did all the traveling all over the world and going to mine sites. I actually stayed home and managed the business, the cash flow, the finance, you know, everything from my office and never left home. So, um, you know, I wasn't very skilled at getting out and about. So when we got divorced and I decided, oh, this coaching looks a good game, I'll go and do that. And I had to go to coach training school. There was one thing they taught us at that that I took on. And I think it's actually one of the secrets to my success. And I think if everyone took this on, that would really help improve their businesses. And we were taught right from the very beginning, don't wait for all your ducks to line up. So what they meant, of course, if anyone hasn't heard that before, don't wait for all your ducks to line up was they meant stop waiting for everything to be perfect before you put something out there or take some action. So we would have, for example, I see it with new coaches all the time because obviously that's who I've been working with for years now is coaches and change makers. I'll see a lot of them will decide, oh, you know, I can't go out and get clients or can't go out and advertise for clients or put myself out on social media right now because I don't have a website. You know, they're wanting everything to be perfect or I can't uh, put my uh, my course out yet because um, it's not perfect and I want to spend a bit more time perfecting it. Well, I'm very much about just get out there, just get stuff done and you can perfect along the way. So that was one of the main things that I took action on was not waiting for things to be perfect. So I had a shit website, sorry, a crap website <laughs> and <laughs> um but you know what? That didn't stop me. I still kept out there. I was getting people, getting clients. My first clients were actually, as a brand new coach, my first clients were seven authors in the US. And that was huge for an Aussie girl who had just started out coaching to have her first clients all international authors. And because I was working with the international authors at that time, people assumed that I was an established coach and I was actually only brand new. But somewhere along the line, I, I, they had the perception and even these authors had the perception that because of the way I put myself out there, that I had to be a long-term experienced coach. I was brand new. I was three months into my coach training and I got seven international authors as clients in one hit. So it's about really um, 
believing in yourself and just putting yourself out there with your message and work as well and not letting any of those ideas of having to have everything perfect hold you back or stop you because we all know that perfection <laughs> is one of the worst things for growth isn't it <laughs> it is i mean you, you hear quite a lot that um if if you don't get any negative comments about the quality of what you've done then you've you waited too long to put it out there you know there's this idea of if, if, if no one says it should probably look a bit better or change the design or whatever because you've probably spent too long on the design yourself before putting it out there so there's there yeah. is that el there is that element of you sort of release it as soon as you can and then you can adjust it and and change it as you go so yeah that's pretty that's pretty solid advice Vanessa for someone that's that's in a position whereby they start saying well when something's in place then I will do it but when this is in place I'll do it when this is in place I'll do it and particularly with with the people that that, that I've seen is a lot of the time that that list gets added to quite a lot <laughs> and that yes. it, it, it almost never ends to a certain extent and get to a point where that that list is is growing and growing and they never actually start anything and, and do anything so yeah I would I would definitely echo that and um, I'm sure I'm sure if it's if it's not hit home for them at the minute and they're listening to this then this is a sign that you know it's time for you to it's time for you to do it rather than the making that list of when it happens I'll do it to get even longer yeah I mean even though I say you know I took that on and I ran with it which to a great extent I did there's one thing that I did do which was a huge mistake it took me two years to get my first group program out because I was spending too long on things like the cover image for the manuals and all this sort of stuff you know just perfect 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 trying to get it absolutely perfect took me two years to get it out there and in that two years you know I'm struggling with trying to get clients and income and all that sort of stuff which is often a constant battle with coaching is keeping that income up at a nice solid level and one day I just finally decided oh that's it I'm biting the bullet I'm putting it out there and see if I get any bites and uh, I you know I had I sold it all just like that and I thought oh if only I'd started this two years earlier <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah definitely and the manuals that I was so worried about nobody even wanted them they didn't want old school manuals they just wanted everything digital and just wanted to download stuff so they didn't care about covers and design and all the rest of it they just wanted their content so I spent a lot of time worrying about stuff that at the end of the day they didn't even utilize or use or want anyway so that's another thing you know find out what people really want instead of what you think they want that's another big trick as well in our industry Oh, so since you spent so long on, on the design for things, making sure that everything was great, to then realise that they never actually used them or, or actually benefited yeah. from them. Oh, that must have been frustrating. Yeah, it was quite funny. Well, when I look back now, I just think, oh, that's hilarious. And when I get, you know, when I'm working with coaches now, um, either one-on-one -on -one or in one of my group programs, that's the first thing I say to them. And most people have this heart attack where they kind of go, oh, I've got to have it all perfect before I can release it. Another thing that shocks them as well is that, I sell now, one of the things I do now is I sell my product before I create it. And a lot of people can't do that. They like to have everything perfect and all created beforehand. And a lot of people are shocked to learn that I sell it. And as long as I'm one week ahead, you know, if I'm delivering modules, as, one of, as long as I'm one week ahead and able to create it one week ahead of you, I'm fine. And that's another secret, I believe, in success is selling it finding out what they want and then be able to create it along the way to their needs and what they want rather than pre-creating and hoping like crazy that it's what they want. Yeah, definitely. I mean, do, do, do you have any suggestions to, to help people do that? So obviously selling and then creating is probably a little bit counterintuitive to to a lot of people because obviously then it's like well you need to know you need to know the product or the service well enough to then be able to sell it so how target. how would you actually go through that process target market research so find out what it is that they want first and then create the idea around it so create you know some images and a copy put it out there see if you get bites if you sell it and you get bites then you start to create it it's really that simple 
So it's, it's target market research, go to your audience, find out what their biggest problem is, you know, what's their biggest pain, and then what do they desire most? How can you deliver what they desire most in a product to them? You don't have to worry about that as such. Just sell the concept of what they what you what you um, what they're going to gain, so that they're going to get from their pain to where they want to do. So you have to know what the result is that you want to deliver with your product, and then you can create it after you've sold it. And that scares a lot of people. That scares so many people about that concept because they want everything created and perfect beforehand. Um, but you'll move faster and you'll be able to create better. So, yes, you need to do the target market research to find out what are some of the things that they'll buy from me, but you don't have to have the product created. You just have to know what it is that you're selling them and what it is you plan on delivering to them. Sell them that and then create the product. <laughs> All right. So once once we've got all this this in a row, once we've got all the the idea of of creating our our, our community and things, and making sure that the the purpose is on point and all of those things, we've spoken about quite a lot. So we've gone from being yourself a lot more all the way through to how to to essentially do that using technology and using Facebook groups. It's been very very wide ranging but if someone just wanted to learn a little bit more if someone wanted to to learn a bit maybe maybe they want um some more information so it could be a book it could be a resource it could be a an app that, that maybe you've you've utilized and found benefits in you do you have any any resource or book recommendations for people um yeah, look, some of the best books, I think, um, was what I was made to read for my coaching. So I discovered a whole world that I didn't know existed before. And that was um, Awaken the Giant with Tony Robbins. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, I'm not sure who the lady's name is, but feel the fear and do it anyway. So I think if you're starting out on, you know, any of this personal development journey and even business development, though they're not totally business books, they're very much about enabling you to build your own confidence and enable yourself to, you know, get out there and, and build your business and, and attract clients because of the confidence that those type of books and the self-awareness that they'll bring to you. So they're two great books as well um, that I actually discovered and, and found to be quite helpful for me in those really, really early days of building my business, especially feel the fear and do it anyway, because that's a, a great motto, isn't it? You know, oh, I'm scared, but let's do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it almost reminds me of the um, analogy of jumping off the, the cliff and building the, the plane on the way down, so to speak. And Yeah, yeah. exactly. All right, cool. Well, we're we're getting close to the end now, so um, I just want to apologise for the the lack of sound beforehand. I think that was probably just a technical thing, so hopefully people would forgive that now. Um, where where would people go if they wanted to find out more about you? So this would be your chance to share links and, and websites and things, Vanessa. Yeah. Well, first off, of course, if you are a, um, you know, a coach or you do are in the change making industry, of course, and just pop into my Facebook group, Coaches, Experts, Changemakers, Step Into the Spotlight. That's fairly easy to find on Facebook, that one. Um, the other thing that you can do is if you want to check out my website, it's just vanessatalbert.com. Very easy. We are, do, um, that should be all up and running we've done some rewrites on that michael but it should be all up and running again soon so all right vanessa well we just have one one last question for you mm -hmm. um it's it's a little bit a little bit different so we've had answers ranging from quite funny all the way to to quite serious so it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be relevant to what we've just spoken about but can be completely different okay. and um I know we've had some we've had some great ones to be honest, and uh, the the question is, what would you like the world to know about you that it doesn't already know? <laughs> I want them to know how much I love chocolate, so they can continue, so they can send me all the chocolate. I love chocolate, especially lint. So if anyone's listening, I love lint chocolate. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, if anyone wants to get on Vanessa's good side, make sure you send us some chocolate. Oh, uh, chocolate will always do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Vanessa. Well, thanks for being a, a guest on the show. Um, it was nice to to have this conversation, and I'm sure we'll we'll keep in touch. Thanks, Michael. <laughs>